Hey folks, Matt Easton here, Scholar Gladiatoria, and this is really kind of a response or follow-up video to Shad, Shadiversity's video, talking about backscabbards, which itself, uh, much like my previous video uh, last week on backscabbards, is a response to Nate V's video talking about backscabbards. Now, this, I don't want to fully retread old ground that we've all talked about backscabbards so much, and I understand uh, that uh, a lot of you are quite sick of the topic of backscabbards, uh, because it has been gone over by so many YouTubers, but I want to bring a couple of points about medieval scabbard or sword wearing uh, into the discussion that hopefully is a slightly new, slightly different stance and view and uh, perspective on the topic that hopefully will add something to your thoughts and is really more about medieval sword wearing than simply the topic of back scabbards. Now, the first thing that I want to say um, as a kind of prelude is that I think that Shad and uh, myself and other people in the past have hit the main points of probably why medieval people weren't wearing scabbards or swords on their backs. Hardly ever. I'll never say never, never say never. Shad went through hundreds or perhaps even thousands of uh, medieval images. As you guys know, I've been doing that for many, many years, and quite simply, it's incredibly difficult to find anything that even, uh, even remotely approaches uh, a medieval European example of wearing on uh, swords on the back. However, uh, as we've all mentioned in previous videos, we do know that it was done sometimes in some places. Why wasn't it done in medieval Europe? Well, I think the, the uh, main two uh, points that we want to hit on are aspects of clothing and also tradition, okay? And why was it tradition to wear the sword at the side? Well, that's the logical place to wear a sword. But I think, uh, you know, as Shad mentioned, wearing of shields on the back, um, very, very important, I think. I don't think it's a coincidence that in places where we do see swords being worn on the back, for example, Japan in the 19th century, and sometimes earlier in Japan as well, shields were practically uh, not used or they weren't used in those particular contexts where swords were being worn on the back. Um, equally, there's some suggestion that maybe it was done with large two-handed swords by Galaglass or Landsknecht. Uh, I don't really think so. I think it was probably carried and only transported on the back, but equally, they are people who tend not to use shields. So I think that definitely shields and clothing, cloaks, major, major factor, and that connects to a, a main point that I'm going to make in a little bit. Um, but I think absolutely having something on your back, um, if you're going to put any kind of cloak over, is a major nuisance. I also don't think we should neglect the subject of riding uh, and look at the way that um, people sat in medieval European saddles and rode horses, and the fact that having a sword on your back would probably be, I'm not a rider, but probably be some degree of inconvenience in that regard as well and that wearing it on your hip, as we all know, generally the sword gets lower slung. If we look at 18th and 19th century hussars, the sword is quite low slung uh, to keep it um, away from the, the saddle, essentially. It's down on the thigh. So I think that plays a part as well. I think the fact that horses and travelling by horse was so common for so many um, uh, parts of society, whether, you know, whether it's a knight or whether it's a common soldier, even archers, even English archers travelled on horseback in the Hundred Years' War. Um, a lot of the time. So um, I think riding is also something we shouldn't neglect from this consideration. Finally, and this is another point that I want to throw into the mix that I'm not sure, I may have mentioned it in the past, but I'm not sure anybody else has really mentioned it. And it's not the main point, the main point will come after this, but this is, this is an additional point that I think should be considered of wearing swords at the hip. Now, a lot of people have talk, talked about, including Shad, talked about the speed of drawing from here and from here and it being about the same. Well, well, yes, whether you're drawing across that shoulder, whether you're trying to draw from this shoulder, or whether you're drawing from the waist down here, yes, it's, it's you know, they're all pretty much of a muchness when it comes to speed. But they are not the same when it comes uh, to the question of where it's coming from and where it's coming to. So interestingly, when Shad drew his sword out, he pulled it out from here and counted that as the ready position. Now, if we were doing kendo, that might be the ready position. However, if we study um, medieval and Renaissance European fencing sources, it's very clear that there is a uh, position in fencing called, if we look at uh, 133 or I-33 sword and buckler source, 
which is the earliest European fencing treaties we have, called Prima Custodia. And equally, if we look in later sources, we look, go all the way to the 19th century and look at Sabo, there's a position called Prime, not suggesting they're the same position, but I'll explain this in a second. There's a position called Prime, uh, which is essentially out here. And there are similar positions in uh, rapier um, treatises as well, uh, which obviously sit chronologically between those two um, extremes, 14th century to 19th century and rapier in the 16th, 17th centuries. So why is this considered the first position? Well, it's considered the first position because it's one of, oh, this is a theory, incidentally, this is not proven fact, but it's a theory and I think a fairly well-founded theory. Um, it's one of the first positions that you get to when you pull your sword out of the scabbard. Okay, so if you're attacked and if you suddenly, and bear in mind this is a sidearm, you don't run around with the weapon in your hand unless you're expecting a fight or expecting or, or want to get arrested if you're in any kind of town or traveling this kind of thing. So if, you're, if you need to get your sword out quickly, um, just as it would be with a pistol, it's all about accessing the weapon and uh, getting it ready to fight with. But unlike a firearm, okay, and unlike Shad's holding the weapon forward here, the sword is both a defensive object and an offensive object. And those two things, whilst they're connected into the art of fencing or martial arts, they are sometimes separate and different actions. Sometimes the action of defending yourself is different to the action of offending the other person. Parry riposte, for example. With a gun, with a pistol, that's not necessarily the same. There are obviously fence positions you can get into with uh, pistols, defensive positions, but I won't go into those here. But fundamentally with a gun, you defend yourself by attacking, okay? Now you could do that with a sword, but usually you don't. Usually if someone's swinging a sword at you, if you just swing a sword at them, you will both get hit by swords and that doesn't necessarily uh, ensure your longevity. Uh, you need to first defend the attacks that's coming in towards you. You can't actively defend with a gun in that way, you just have to attack. So if you get your sword out, the first thing you have to do is you have to get your sword in front of your body in a line that protects yourself. And that is why, and this is how the theory goes, that is one reason why this first position here, or indeed if we're coming out under the arm with the buckler out here, is the first position or prime or prima or prima custodia. So if that's the first position you're coming to, that is because you have been attacked and you are transitioning through a defensive posture or position in order to get yourself on guard. Come on guard. You don't just come on guard by just pointing the sword at the enemy. You transition through a position which is somehow protecting you if that's protected you, fine. And now maybe you come into your fencing position, whatever it might be, okay? Now, if you're drawing a sword from a back scabbard, uh, let's take the, I don't have a back scabbard, but if you're drawing a sword from a back scabbard either side here, first of all, you have to get your arm up to this position, okay? And then you're drawing up here, essentially behind your back. Whereas when you're drawing the sword from here, it's coming forwards the whole way. And also note, if we go to Japanese martial arts, this isn't just a European thing, where the edge with a katana would be upwards instead of downwards, and bear in mind with a two-edged European sword, you can do the same thing because it's got two edges. You could additionally, with a messer with a one-edged sword like this, just turn the edge upwards if you want to do the same thing. You can in one movement, just like in the Aido, you can in one movement get your hand to the sword, pull out here, and attack with it in one motion. Now you could do that, from here, okay? Some people were saying, oh, well, once you've got the sword out here, you can attack. That is true, you can just attack. But when you're coming from below here, you have the option to directly attack, as in Yaido, or you've got the, uh, you've got the option to defend, coming up to this side or straight to that side, um, or straight into a more preem position in the later uh, systems. So you've got tactical options when you're bringing the sword from down here that brings the blade in front of and across your body as you draw it out. If you're reaching the hand over the shoulder behind the body, the blade spends a lot of time behind you before you're able to get it in front of you, either to defend or to attack. So that's a point that I think has been a bit neglected in this discussion between waist or belt worn um, swords or even the baldric and under the arm type sword versus back wearing. So finally we come to my main point and this point could be applied in answer to not just to Shad or to Nate or anyone else, any of the main 
um, commentary, any of the main commentators on this subject of wearing swords on the back. And it is to do with the most fundamental aspect of why is this sword in this scabbard. Now you could say it's to protect other people and that would be partially true. It could be to say just carry the sword around and that would be partially true. Both of those things can be um, done in other means, in other ways. But fundamentally, one of the main reasons that scabbards are made the way that they are is to protect the sword. And it doesn't matter whether we're talking about a medieval European longsword or indeed if we're talking about a um, Han uh, Dynasty Chinese sabre. It doesn't matter what we're talking about. It could be a, uh, it could be a uh, cutlass. It could be all sorts of things. Fundamentally, the scabbard is partially there so you can wear the sword and carry the sword, and it's also there to protect the sword. Okay, now, um, why do you want to protect the sword? Well, the sword is a valuable object. Um, equally, you want to make sure that it is a functional weapon, that the edges are protected and kept sharp, and they're protected from rust and uh, being knocked about and all this kind of thing. Now, if your primary goal is to protect your sword, then if you're wearing a sword at your waist down here, um, one of the main things that you're going to be worried about is rain. Now, as someone who has worn a sword for hours at a time in rain, because I live in England, I live in Europe, in certainly in Northern Europe, we do suffer rain and snow and other things which will be really annoying to your expensive sword, whether it's an expensive sword that is fancy and you want to protect for, um, you know, for aesthetic and financial reasons, or whether it's because you want to protect it for functional and utilitarian reasons, you want to protect that weapon. So you have it in a wood-lined, leather-covered scabbard. This is the standard type of medieval scabbard. It's not a simple leather scabbard, it is a wood-lined Sometimes if we go into the early medieval period, it even has uh, wool or types of fur inside the scabbard as well. And then on the outside, it has leather and sometimes with metal fittings such as a chape and so on. So your scabbard is to protect your sword and prevent it essentially rusting um, in a rainy, potentially rainy environment. Oh, I understand this doesn't necessarily apply to all places in the world, but we're talking about medieval Europe here. Okay, so your scabbard is there to protect your sword sword. Um, now, if it's raining, the first thing that I'm going to do is my sword is down here. It is below a quite a bit of my body, but nevertheless, I'm probably going to cover it up and prevent the worst of the rain getting on it. If the rain uh, really starts to get nasty, I'm going to throw a cloak on. So we come back to cloaks again, but we're not necessarily thinking about the ease of getting the cloak on and off. We're thinking, why are we wearing a cloak? Well, we're wearing a cloak to stay dry. And it doesn't need to be a cloak. It could be a hoopland or any sort of other outer garment. And in fact, in the 15th century, we even see outer garments with, um, with slots and holes in them so that the weapons can project out um, so you can still access them. But the point is you're putting an outer garment on that will protect your weapon from the rain. The problem <laughs> with a back scabbard is you can't really do that because you can't really, um, certainly not conveniently and easily, put your outer garment over, I'm going to try and hold this at my back, you can't really put your outer garment over the um, hilt, okay? The hilt's the first problem. This is going to get super, super rusty, super nasty. The leather of the grip is going to absorb lots of water and get in a horrible state. That water is going to penetrate the wood and potentially rust the tang inside, bearing in mind on medieval swords. The wooden grip is not glued onto the tang as a lot of, a lot of modern replicas are. It is just slotted on there and then held in compression. So you've got a lot of water damage going onto your hilt, which is not covered and protected by your clothing or its placement on your body. It's very, very exposed there. Additionally, we have the problem of the scabbard. Now, there are on some swords something called a, a rain flap, whether they are, I know Roland Vorchecker has other theories for what they're for, but they are commonly known as a rain flap. And that sits around, sometimes, around the top of the scabbard and forms a seal on later Victorian swords. Um, grab one here. Uh, we have a leather washer there which forms a seal with the top of the scabbard there and means any rain coming down here can't go into the scabbard. So we know demonstrably with evidence there is uh, good supporting um, evidence to show that they were concerned about rain getting into scabbards and they didn't want that. If a scabbard is hanging at that angle at your side and has a cloak over it, you actually have relatively minimum risk of rain penetrating your scabbard. 
However, if it's on your back pointing straight upwards with no cloak over it, I would imagine there is a very, very high risk and high probability of a lot of rain not only soaking the whole hilt but getting down into the scabbard. So there we go. Um, it's such a simple thing, but it seems to be so widely overlooked that the fundamental purpose of wearing a scabbard of relatively robust proportions and complex construction is to protect your sword. What would be then the point in putting your sword on a part of your body where it's now extremely exposed to the elements and is going to suffer as a result? So there we go. I hope that's given another aspect and another way of approaching this uh, topic. Um, and I hope it's been interesting. Give us a like and a subscribe. I will see you really soon on Scholar Gladiatorial channel for another video. Check out Shad's video. I'll put the link uh, to his video below. And I'll see you really soon. Cheers, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.